Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Okay, it looks like we are just about ready to get going here. So I'm going to encourage you to uh, join me in a word of prayer. And upon doing so, we will get back to work. With all heads bowed and eyes closed, oh Lord, we come before you once again and we do so with rejoicing. We are indeed rejoicing in our hearts. The more we know about you, Father, the more there is reason and occasion to rejoice. You are indeed a good God. You are a great God. And you are a gracious God. And we are the recipients of your manifold blessings. Over and over again, you keep on blessing us. And every day that we are afforded the opportunity to praise your holy name, we should do so. So surely, O oh Lord, as we have gathered here this morning for this assembly, it is appropriate that we incorporate worship and praise of your holy name. We do so not only with our lips, but our hearts as well. We recognize that without you, we can do nothing. And since we've assembled for the express purpose of learning more about you through your word, how to handle your word rightfully and to become more skillful, we know that all of these things come from heaven above. All knowledge, understanding, truth, wisdom. It all comes from you. So Lord, we are eager. We are even excited for this assembly this morning. We are also excited about every believer who assigns his or herself to your word with a right understanding. And that is, we have for too long handled your word in a misguided way. But we praise you, Father, for bringing us to a better place in these days. We pray your continued strength for all who will yield their lives and surrender their lives. In other words, for all who will learn how to trust you. We've been trusting ourselves too long for our lives. Thank you, Father, for bringing us to a place where we are now learning how to trust you with our lives. It's in the mighty name of Jesus we do pray. 
Amen. Let me say good morning and welcome back to the Epistle of James. This is week number two. I apologize. I was looking back over the records and realized I changed week one to week one and two. So late this morning, I sent you an email that has the uh, updated uh, version of the agenda for weeks one and two. It's no, it's no big, uh, major change from the agenda you're looking at from last week, except it does indicate weeks one and two. So I just want you to be mindful of that uh, uh, development here late this morning. Um, but I'm looking forward and I'm excited here to be returning to our introductory uh, uh, lessons for the Epistle of James. Uh, we'll spend about three weeks in the introduction section. I'm thanking God once again for each of you. Uh, I'm ready to get right back to work. And um, I want to open up with asking Patricia to turn to your notes from last week. I want to come right back to our work of the place of James, the epistle of James among the general epistles and our New Testament canon. Patricia, I want to ask this question beginning with you. What are the implications of the place of James in the New Testament canon? Particularly, what I'm interested in is the date of this epistle. What are the implications of the date of the epistle of James? In other words, how should the, what we believe to be the date of this epistle, in what way, if any, should it inform the way we, our attitude as Bible students today, when we read and study the epistle of James? Okay, I'll let Patricia go on that. And I'll encourage uh, all of you to look at <laughs> uh, it. In my note, I um, don't have, I, I don't think that particular answer that you're looking for, uh, I didn't take, I don't think I took very many notes. Uh, about the uh, the era, the year I did do the mostly uh, the uh, feast of the uh, the tabernacle, the booth. Um, so okay, uh, oh. well, well, then if you don't have it in your notes, then I'm going to presume I was talking about something you already know if you didn't write it down. So, do you have any knowledge of what's your information about the date of this epistle and what are the ramifications or how, if any way, the date should inform Bible students today? So are you telling me uh, not only do you not have notes, but you don't have a clue <laughs> what I'm asking? <laughs> not, not really, because the only okay. thing I, I'm going back to is um, that James uh, has an emphasis on works um, and uh, the, trans the, the transition out uh, of the Old Testament period. That's, that's the, about the only Okay. Okay. Well, well, actually, that might be uh, uh, some significant information. Uh, Esteria is going to help you out. Go ahead, Esteria. What are the implications know. of the date of the epistle, James? I'm not sure that I'm going to help her out, but I'm going to give you the, <laughs> my, my notes here, scraggly as they are. Shantae had mentioned something about the early writing date of the book of James is a reason that is needed for insight into the transitional nature of the New Testament times. And um, uh, you said it was critical to understand the book. Okay, so, and I, I have a, a, a blank there. So I, I don't know how that helps, if, if at all, and what I need to fill in, okay? But I did okay. write. Okay. Uh, uh, uh. It sounds like, um Hysteria, what I got out of what you're saying is the date for the epistle of James require 
requires that Bible students are sensitive to the transitional nature of what's said in the book, in the epistle of James. You, this Bible reader, the Bible student has to be mindful of the transitional nature. It sounds like uh, hysteria is saying there. Uh, did I, did I uh, recap what you're saying correctly, hysteria? I think so. And I have an additional question here, if I may ask it, because it's OK. OK. You you also mentioned, and I didn't get this complete either, that the, the more cultural and historical the uh, context is uh, for the uh, teaching, the less normative it is for us today, uh, the church. So yeah. how do those two go together? Your question and my question? Right. No, no, no. Your question... Yes, that's right. Your question and my question. Okay. How does uh, anybody want to take that on? Uh, I know Fritzy and Glenn, your hand was already up, but would anybody like to uh, take on a serious question? My question is, what are the implications of the date of the epistle of James a serious question is, how does uh, 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 the, the fact that uh, the more historical and cultural the content of a book of the Bible contains, the less normative it is for the church throughout the church age? Who would like to take it? How do those That's two great. come together? Yeah, how you doing? Good. Okay. Hey, well. Go ahead. Chris, okay. want to speak first. Okay. Okay. Um, I was, speak first. Yeah. I was going to say that, well, the, knowing the historical cultural context tells me that since this was an earliest, the earliest epistle, and I don't know if that came out, that it, the audience was, were all Jews. So that transition to the audience changed um, to answer a serious question. So we know that God. Uh, uh, the transitional nature, meaning that God is progressive. So now we see that the church is no longer all Jews. Okay, okay. Sounds like Fritzy is addressing my question, not a serious question, <laughs> but, but my, she is giving implications for a, a, a student approach to reading and studying the epistle of James. For it sounds like Fritzy is saying uh, 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 the mere fact of its early date believed to be the earliest of the New Testament written of the New Testament canon uh, uh, um, that a Bible student should be cautious and, and, and should be sensitive to that very early date as this chart here of the uh, New Testament church period is uh, uh, depicting here. Okay, that's yeah. uh, that. I think that is critical. Glenn, yeah. go ahead. Okay, so to add on to that, the connection is that since it is very, it's still a very Jewish cultural uh, uh, background, and since it's the earliest epistle, it deals with a, a lot of the law, the orders that they're doing to the law and how they look at the law pertaining to this new movement. Yeah, I really like that, what Glenn is saying. Glenn is saying, so then, uh, James is written during Second Temple era Judaism. And it is written in that uh, his, uh, uh, hysteria, that is the historical and cultural context in which James emphasizes so much more since it is the earliest written book of the New Testament scriptures. It is written at a time we can know, Asteria, the thought of this human author. We're going to get into the human author. Who is this James today? And knowing who this James is, can guide us today away from error. If we are willing to uh, uh, stay close to the scriptures, 
get out of our minds all of a lot of the talk and information we think we know about this author and this book of the Bible. Let scripture within itself informs us. And what Glenn is telling us, Fritzy is telling us, uh, uh, what, what it sounds like hysteria they're saying is, we do have to be sensitive and mindful of the second temple era thought. Uh, uh, James is writing as a person who observes the religion of Judaism. He is not, he is not totally convinced that Jews should not observe the law of Moses. James is not convinced of that. And so as you and I approach this book of the Bible, we have to be sensitive to that. James will say some things that are very legal. And from his perspective, he sees what he's saying through the lens of legalism and from through the Mosaic law. This is where it requires skill on the part of the Bible student today. So I hope that, Patricia, I hope you are writing today <laughs> and some of these things are landing with you. And I hope in all of that hysteria, you can see a correlation between my question and the question you're asking. So the more the Bible student is able to identify uh, uh, those uh, elements in a book of the Bible that are Jewish. See, that's our problem. We see we and, and, and what God has done for all for us, and we insert ourselves in that. When in fact, the, the farther context will show that the human author is, is talking about Jews and not non-Jews in many places. So there, is, there are steps or layers before that passage of scripture becomes applicable to non-Jews and an unwillingness to take those steps or to be ignorant about how to take those steps. Uh, 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 leaves us in a place where the Holy Spirit, the true teacher, is limited in his capacity to guide us and direct us. If we go off on a path of error, then he, it is more difficult for him to bring us to truth, to, for us to identify and recognize truth when we become hardened in a path of error. I hope all of that makes sense, Hysteria, a little bit, but I really thank you, Glenn, Fritzy, and for those of you who have chimed in on that. I know Alicia's been waiting patiently. Come on, Alicia, you might want to add something to that. I was going to add um, the area that Glenn went to, um, I typed in the chat, well, the start of the discussion, you kept mentioning how James covers the same, will be considered like uh, a gospel book because of its time period. So I didn't know that, that would be like another um, connection for how those two can be combined by Mrs. Steria's question, because that's what I was thinking of that led into everything you just said, but it gave a good example of everything he's talking about being the early epistle um, within the book covers that same time period. And so the audience and all that would be similar um, mm -hmm. in what they understood or had in common yeah, as the original yeah. readers. Yeah, it is. Uh, that might be helpful for us as Bible students. We have come to a place where we tend to have more appreciation for the fact that the gospel times are uh, uh, covered, uh, is covered or covers the end of the old covenant period. So I think we are okay drawing that line a, a, a somewhat of an imaginary line, watch this here. I think we are okay drawing this line here straight from the gospels to the old covenant. But as Alicia is saying, you should also include the epistle of James, especially 
as though it's a part of the gospel times. The truth of the matter is this is true of the entire New Testament, as we said last week. In some way, this, this same thing is true of the entire New Testament. What is true? In some way, the entire New Testament must be, uh, the Bible student today must be mindful of, of the transitional nature of the, um, the contents of the New Testament scriptures in this way. No doubt about it. So I hope Patricia and Hysteria and others, I hope that's making sense. In other words, we have made a lot of errors in the way we uh, approach the Bible and understand the New Testament scriptures because we just have not been trained to identify hysteria, those historical and cultural situations, what's happening behind the scriptures, we have just not been trained to do that. So we, we just, it, it's, it's not our fault. It's nothing we can do about it. Uh, we just have to rely on leaders to, to guide us in their sermons, et cetera, because we have not been trained to do so. So I, I want to thank all of you for that discussion. Renita, I thought I saw your hand at some point. Some, I, I apologize for that. Somebody probably just said what you were getting ready to say. But if you had any additional comments, go ahead, Renita. No, I didn't. Fritzy said what I was going to say. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, any other Eureka moments? I, I wanted to just open up by bringing you back to where we left off. We're using the same PowerPoint presentation. We got through about slide number three or four. We're gonna come back to that today in our introduction here. But any other Eureka moments, Alicia? Mine was for the question um, that I sent you. It's gonna come up later. Okay. Um, but I think it's still foundational to the class, especially for those um, who are taking it for the second time, like myself. Um, so just looking at some of the information, I was trying to make a connection through like, like research to see if there was any readings, which you, it by no means am I saying that it can be exhaustive right now because there's a lot of readings like the rabbinic literature and all of that we know of the second tip of error that we've been trained in to look at, to understand more of the situation or background for the New Testament. So um, in looking at James over the weekend, I was trying to make sense of how they, um, the author meaning of the book and others, uh, how to understand what they will call Messianic Jews and so um, I wanted to see where that was. If it was in scripture, why is it being used? And I had a note about Paul, which kind of led me into that, I guess, research or study, if you will. And so I kept seeing that two audiences of James, you know, were the Orthodox Jews and Messianic Jews. And it was interesting because all of what I was finding, no one made that connection because it's not there. And when I was listening to the context of what like the commentators were saying and then comparing um, what they had from one, uh, you know, from one commentator to the other, I saw that that term came much later, not even right outside of, you know, the apostolic period during the uh, modern or postmodern times in scripture. And so what they consider Messianic Jews is really those who follow Christ. But I also was beginning to see why Christianity uses that because they try to justify, especially the religious discussion that's in the book of James. They try to justify, you know, the, the forming of Christianity as a religion and anything that comes from it as you know, like that view one on the chart, they believe it started then. So that was a blessing because I just wanted to walk through it so that I can be able to understand it and, and hopefully articulate it in a way um, so that it, it becomes more, you know, 
applicable in my mind in seeing it. So that was, that's my Eureka moment. I was okay. grateful to do that work and kind of see how they got to that place of using that term. Uh, well, good. Uh, thank you for sharing that uh, uh, with us, your journey with us, Alicia. Yes, uh, Messianic Jews is a modern, uh, um, a modern concept. Um, from a biblical perspective, all Jews are Messianic Jews. Uh, uh, so, so we would have to be careful about the sources, the agenda of sources that we read. Uh, uh, um, if I'm reading Christian sources, Christian sources might try to make everybody in the gospel Christians, the, the first Christians, that kind of thing. So, so Messianic Jews, when a person talk about Messianic Jews and put them in the first century uh, 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 in Jesus's time, uh, 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 they are in essence trying to uh, superimposing a much later uh, uh, institution into the Bible. Well, there was no such thing as Messianic Jews in the scriptures. Why? Because all Jews were looking for the Messiah. <laughs> all Jews were Messianic Jews. That was a part of Second Temple era Judaism. Uh, uh, so it uh, sounds like Alicia in her study began to realize that it, it's not a biblical development. It's a post-biblical development. But now, now that we understand what the claims of Messianic Jews are today, now when we look back, you could say, yes, <laughs> any Jew who believed that Jesus of Nazareth was the Messiah then that makes that Jew a Messianic Jew in the way in which it is termed today. But all Jews would have considered themselves Messianic Jews in that they had a hope for the Messiah in the first century uh, times uh, in the Middle East and in the entire world. All Jews scattered throughout the entire world was looking for the hope or the expectation of Israel of a Messiah. But uh, some believed that Jesus of Nazareth was that expected Messiah. And those are the people uh, 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 among which uh, uh, would later develop the modern development of Messianic Jews uh, uh, would fit with. There were people who believed Jesus of Nazareth was the Messiah, but who would not, who Christians do not consider Messianic Jews as well. We'll, we'll talk about that. We'll get into that as well. Uh, Paul identified Jews who he would not conclude to be a Messianic Jew if you were to use that language. They believed in Jesus, but they believed in another Jesus, or they believed in something other than the gospel truth about Jesus. So he wouldn't consider them Messianic Jews. And so, uh, so, so yes, that's a good discussion. Uh, 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 and it sounds like you've done, you were on the right track in your research on that. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you for sharing that with us. Anybody else? Well, then here today, we're going to return back to the place of James among the general epistles and then move on in further into our introduction uh, of, of, of the letter in the church, the authorship, and how did James become a leader of the Jesus community. And as we talk about more broadly, um, as we talk more broadly about transition, the thing of it is there's like transition within transition. I just think it is so critical for Bible students to develop more and more a closeness, a familiarity with the development, the evolution of the church of Jesus Christ. It did just not, even though we say the church was born and began on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter two, 
I think it is so important that Bible students, uh, 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 if you are going to follow Jesus Christ as his disciple and for his word to inform his teachings, to inform our lives today, we are going to have to develop a, a, a more than casual relationship with the scriptures. We are going to have to seek more deeply the things of God, the mind of God. And, and I pray that this training is going uh, towards that end, helping us modeling how we should approach every book of the Bible, uh, uh, not just the Bible as a whole unit, but since we now know the Bible uh, is better understood as a library of books, not one book, but a library of books, which means I have to do this work with every book of the Bible. I don't just do this work with the Bible as a whole, I have to do this background information, authorship, and apply other hermeneutical principles and rules to every book of the Bible every time I come across a book. And why am I doing this? I, I hope we are understanding that my pursuit of closing the distance gap with every single book of the Bible before I start really uh, critically studying the contents of that book, spend significant time. Oftentimes when people ask me questions about the scriptures, this passage here or this verse here, it becomes instantaneously clear to me. You don't know background. You haven't done background study. <laughs> You, you have not done a literary analysis of that book of the Bible. Those questions could be relatively easily settled for you if you were to do that work. So I just want to encourage us, not only here with the epistle of James, we must spend this kind of time with every book of the Bible. I didn't know, Alicia, if your hand was still up or, just, uh, or if you had a new a question. Okay. Well, let's 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 get on back to work then. Let's let's get on back to this then where we stopped off on last week. Going back to the PowerPoint slide, we are talking about the place of James among the general epistles. Let me read the last a couple of sentences at the bottom of slide number three. It had become clear to the Jerusalem church that the gospel was being spread beyond Judea to Samaria and Galilee and Syria. I hope you can identify the stories with beyond Judea to Samaria. Someone raise your hand and point me in a situation beyond Judea to Samaria. Give me a passage of scripture that will point us to this, the support of that statement. Acts chapter eight would be support of that statement. Galilee, what would be in support of Galilee? Acts chapter 10 and 11, Syria, Acts chapter 11, where the disciples are first called Christians. So uh, 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 when I say it had become clear to the Jerusalem church. So by the Acts 15, one through five, the council of, of, of Jerusalem in Acts chapter 11, when Peter comes back from Caesarea, Cornelius, and reports back to the Jerusalem church, what is becoming clear to the Jerusalem church, this brings in ge geography here. So what's becoming clear to the, uh, 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 let me find another map here that might show it better. What's becoming clear to the uh, Jerusalem church 
Peter has now been to Caesarea. Uh, 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 they've been out in Joppa. Uh, 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 Philip is all up throughout Samaria. Uh, 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 um, and here's the Syrian church, the Syrian area. Uh, uh, where Antioch is just a little bit north here of this map, map in Syria. So it's becoming clear to the Jerusalem church, okay, maybe we haven't understood this thing. So what am I saying? The church in red here is beginning to recognize if after the first 15 years, okay, maybe we haven't fully understood how this Holy Spirit, how he is working among God's people, especially non-Jews, the Gentiles. So we, we, we're right at that place there. So, so in other words, why from a human perspective did James write the epistle of James? Why did he write this epistle? From James's human perspective, that sentence is why he wrote this epistle. Okay. The church is spreading. The church is growing, spreading geographically. One, and what's another situation? The church is also being persecuted. So there is a reason for this outgrowth uh, of many of the people I came up with, the 120 of Acts chapter 1, the people who was praying in Acts chapter 12 when Peter was miraculously released from jail and we all were in the upper room praying. Um, James is saying uh, uh, these people are being persecuted and are speak. The people we were accustomed to on Pentecost, the day of Pentecost, Acts 2, 46 and 47, Acts 3, Acts 4, Acts 5. Many of those people who were in class with me every day, I now don't see them anymore. They are, are, they are being scattered because of persecution. So James writes this letter to people he would have once been a leader of in the Jerusalem church. Yes, Alicia. I do think you answered it, but I'm still asked just because um, I wanna be clear. I hope it's okay to ask. How is X one and eight? Because I sometimes confuse the eight and and the one and eight. Is that um, an adequate scripture in response to the question you initially asked about the geographical? Yeah, in one and eight we get what is called a a, a prophetic explanation for what's happening on the ground uh, right. uh, uh, some years later after Acts 1 and 8 is prophetically uttered in the mm -hmm. command by Jesus himself. So Jesus gives the what's going to happen. He just don't tell them the circumstances. Now we are right. talking about okay. the circumstances of Jesus's prophetic utterance in Acts 1 and 8. And that is something that as students of God's word, it is so valuable for you and I. We must uh, understand this historical and cultural perspective, this literary perspective of the scriptures, that everything is not pie in the sky. <laughs> everything is not, we are allowed through the word of God to, in a sense, look behind the divine curtain. But the divine curtain view that we have is always accompanied or in most cases accompanied with a very 
practical world view and perspective of God's divine intervention. And I think being imbalanced as a Bible student, looking so much at the divine and not be concerning ourselves with the human circumstances causes God's people not to be in a good place to follow Jesus Christ. Because if I'm looking wrongly for God to do the spectacular, uh, uh, I miss every day in my life his intervention. And I do not learn to appreciate what he's doing every day in my life looking for the spectacular. I hope that makes sense. So yes, there is a relationship between the Acts 1 and 8 and understanding the background circumstances of what's happening as to why James will write this first letter of the New Testament canon. So uh, thank you for that question. Uh, I see Alicia, your hand is still up. Was there something else? Yes, I was gonna say, um... Thank you for that. I was trying to connect it in, I guess, going in the, the not chronology, but well, yeah, the chronological aspect, but also the framework in seeing it there. So when you said prophetic, that that's when it hit for me. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Yeah. Okay, good. Good question. Let's move on then to slide number four. At the same time, Paul and Barnabas had been sent on their first missionary journey. Uh, the work opened the door for the gospel to be preached among the Jews uh, and Gentiles in Asia Minor. So what do I mean by in at the same time? Let's look at the chart, at the same time. So the first missionary journey is is in close proximity to the epistle, the writing of the epistle of James within a couple of years, within a year or so, because all of these times are estimates. They are not hard uh, uh, dates, they are estimates. So around 46, whereas the epistle of James is written around 45, 46, so about the same time in within the margin of error of a date, these two events are in essence happening around the same time. What two events? This one right here, let me get it uh, 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 identified. So the Paul's missionary journey, and let me duplicate that and make this one red. So, so his missionary journey, so watch this here. So Paul's missionary journey and the epistle of James are in essence, these two things are happening around the same time. James is seeing the church expanding, but James still thinks the church is Jewish. But what James is not aware of, and he is likely hearing some of the fallout of what Paul's first missionary journey. James, there is no doubt in my mind, James is not completely unaware of Paul's first missionary journey. Watch this. As Paul is out here, so, so, so James is down here in, in Jerusalem. Paul leaves from Antioch and goes on his first missionary journey to Antioch, Antioch, Pisidia, Iconium, Lystra, Derby, and then makes his turn and come back. Now, there is no doubt in my mind that journey takes six months to a year. There is no doubt James is hearing about the activity of Paul and Barnabas. James would have been responsible, would have been one of the leaders who put Paul in his position. What position did, what office did Paul hold at Antioch? What office did Paul hold at Antioch? Uh, let me take Denise on that. Denise, what office would uh, Paul and Barnabas have held at Antioch? 
Well, I'm going to say elders. Yes, they would have been among the council of elders of the church at Antioch. And James would have been responsible for their appointment. So James is higher in the church than Paul is at this point. Why do we say that? Because the scriptures tell us in Acts chapter 11, it was the leaders of the church at Jerusalem that sent Barnabas up to Antioch. And Barnabas went over here to Tarsus and got Paul home and brought him to Antioch. And by the time of Acts chapter 13, we see both Barnabas and Paul are among the teachers uh, in Acts chapter 11, say they talked for a couple of years there. So they're at Antioch. So James has some familiarity by all meaning, all meaning with the Apostle Paul. Any questions on that? Well, what am I modeling for you all? Uh, 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 you and I must become familiar with the chronology, the historicity, knowing the historical circumstances behind the scriptures so that we can guard against error. We don't need a, a commentary or secondary source telling us things that do not fit with the circumstances of the scriptures. So at the same time Paul and Barnabas had been sent on their first missionary journey, the work opened the door for the gospel to be preached among Jews and Gentiles in Asia Minor. James most likely wrote his epistle to the Jewish congregations along the Mediterranean seacoast during the year that Paul and Barnabas taught the disciples at Antioch. There we go. It is due to the general designation of several Jewish congregations that the epistle is classified among the general epistles. The epistle may have been intended for a wider diaspora, but did not receive a broad circulation until three centuries later. So if James wrote this letter, in approximately 45 AD, AD 45, why am I asserting that it wasn't till about 350, AD 350, before this letter had broad circulation? How can I say that? How do I know the whole church was not reading the epistle of James uh, uh, um, uh, throughout the Roman Empire or throughout the diaspora or throughout the world at the time. How do you know the whole world, all the church of Jesus Christ was not reading this inspired book of the Bible? Anybody on that? How, do, how can we say that? And is that a thing we should say? And uh, what ramifications or importance does a statement like that have? How do we know this letter is not read in Italy, Macedonia, in Libya, Egypt, Mesopotamia? We know they're, they're the diaspora Jews were at this time all over the world. Yes, uh, Fritz and Glenn and then Renita. Well, if you do, if you if you do a study of the early church fathers, they hadn't uh, did their uh, due diligence in circulating that book. It has to be seen in the uh, Jewish history that uh, they had even, they had disputed James' book from the beginning. It didn't make that circuit. They didn't. It didn't make that circulation that they were not reading it in all the uh, churches that were there. Okay. So, so Glenn is saying uh, 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 you'd have to study church history to understand the, the validity, how valid and how significant that statement is. Glenn is saying you have to know church history. I like that, Renita. I was thinking the fact that the New Testament wasn't canonized yet. Um, okay. And like Glenn was saying, most of the general epistles were disputed until it was canonized in the late 300 BC. 
Yeah, so uh, Renita basically echoing what Glenn has said, it, it, it speaks to the importance of canonization that Bible students uh, uh, mature about the canonization process as well as inspiration. We need to mature about both of those uh, as it pertains to both of those processes. That the scriptures, the Bible as we know it today uh, 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 did not fall out of the sky, but it emerged and evolved over time. And our knowledge and acquaintance with that process over time uh, contains uh, uh, information that is pertinent for the way we understand these scriptures. I'm still thinking, Asteria, about your question last week about this uh, 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 faith without works is dead. Well, the things we continue to discuss here today pertaining the place of this letter in the uh, a canon of the New, well, the New Testament canon hysteria, the writing of this letter, all of that information informs how we should properly hear that statement of James. And so if you don't know this background information and you're just reading the scriptures, then of course that's a troubling statement as well as many statements in the Bible. Many statements in the scriptures are troublesome and cannot be resolved or reconciled without this kind of background training. I hope that makes sense. Any, any further question about that? Well, let's, let's look at some of the information. Our textbook author helps us with some of this on page 27. We're going to get right to work in our introduction here. The textbook author helps us with the place of this letter. And you have a number of resources from this training where what we're getting ready to go over in the next two to three pages, you have at least in three or four of your textbooks in this training. So you are not without the information. I, I understand it may have been so overwhelming. You need uh, to go back over those classes or, or, or need some, some a, a refresher on how to use some of those resources, but you have this information over and over again. Look at uh, 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 the very first statement on page 27, the introduction, the letter in the church. The epistle of James has had a controversial history. And what Glenn is saying and Renita is saying, you need to be acquainted with that controversy. Instead of saying, I'm reading a book inspired by God. This is God, the divine author wrote this book. I need to be, as a student of God's word, acquainted with the controversial history of the epistle of James. Along with 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John and Jude, it belongs to that category of New Testament epistles called general or Catholic. Let me go to the last sentence here. In the case of James, in that first paragraph, it was not until the end of the fourth century, uh oh, there we go, from AD 45 to AD 350 to AD 399. That's what we mean by the end of the fourth century, that both Eastern and Western Christendom acknowledged it as scripture. So, e, what is Eastern and Western Christendom? What do we mean by that, Eastern and Western Christendom? Somebody answer that. What is Eastern and Western Christendom? Anybody on that? What is Eastern and Western Christendom? Come on, Renita. I'm going to say the Greek and the Orth Greek Orthodox and the Roman Catholic um Christianity that existed at that time after the 
you are absolutely right. So here is the Roman Empire divided in the West. Uh, 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 that's Western Christendom. And the East is over here where the dotted line divides and that's Eastern Christendom. So where Christianity, the religion, the worldwide re Roman religion. So it's the worldwide Roman religion that gave us the canon of scriptures that we have. So what you believe to be scriptures, what you believe to be the scriptures came from the Catholic and the Protestant teachings. So it's, it, at this time, there is no Protestant church. It's only the Catholic church. And so the Catholic church gave us our canon of scriptures. You and I just need to be okay with that. When we look at the development of the New Testament canon, this is just a fancy chart of this one right here, one that you're more familiar with. It's much more simple. And you see where James is. Uh, by the time you get to the origin, James is among the disputed books for hundreds of years. Now, when you drill down, as Glenn said, into that history, what you will find out is it's disputed by some. Others have not even heard of the epistle of James. It's disputed by whom? Origin, Eusebius. There are bishops, church leaders, Christian leaders who never heard of the epistle of James, especially in the West. As Bible students today, you and I need to be equipped with that information. Any questions about that? And we should uh, work hard and pray about the appreciation. So how long did it not, was it unknown and not widely circulated for generations? For, for how many, what, what, what do you mean generations? Your mother, your grandmother, your great-grandmother, your great-great-great-grandfather never heard of the book of James. That's, that's the kind of time we're talking about. Four or five generations of family members never eat, lived their lives and died and never heard of the epistle of James as a, a book of the Bible. Wow. That's no small matter that there were generations of people who, who revered the word of God, but never heard of an epistle of James. So, so don't let this chart fool you. Watch this. Don't let this chart fool you when it says disputed. The truth of the matter is most Christians had not even heard of it. Most Christians during 250, 300, and from 300 to 400 had not even heard of the epistle of James. Shante. Yeah, that, that's a really good statement you're making there. And I believe the first time I've actually um, understood what you mean by that, it really explains the controversy or the depth of controversy around this book. I think we don't tend to get that deep into who knew about it, who had access to it, who never, you know, who never read it. And we think that it impacted more people than it actually did. Yeah. Because we see we see Jesus and the word of God as this big, uh, you know, big book that everybody had. But this ties to your um, discussion about the scriptures, <laughs> them being written separately, being circulated separately, access to them. But I think even more, it brings about the depth of controversy that it really lies in this book. 
So thank you for saying that. Yeah, you are absolutely right. And that is my intent. I wanted to impress upon serious Bible students today to be mindful <laughs> that how we approach the Bible here in 2021, the church throughout the history of the church has not always had the privilege, the perspective that we have today. And being mindful and aware and sensitive to that uh, a truth is critical for the way we handle God's word today. Yes, Bernice. I just want to make sure that I'm getting a clear understanding. You mean mm -hmm. to tell me my great, 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 great grandmother didn't know about James? No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying if you would have lived, say Bernice, if you would have lived between, say, uh, uh, 30 AD when the church began, uh -huh. all the way to about 400 AD, anywhere in those 400 years, then that would have been true. Oh, okay. I, I, didn't, mean, I didn't mean to uh, suggest that that's true about <laughs> your actual uh, ancestry today. But if your ancestry, if, <laughs> yes, if you and your ancestry lived in the first 400 years of church history, then it would be possible and even likely that your great, great, great grandparents never heard of the epistle okay. of James as a book of the Bible and neither would you have heard of it. We've been living in the United, the United States of America has been a country for 270 odd years. So just imagine the epistle of James would have still not been in the Bible since wow. the independence of America. Wow. Okay, I just wanted to get a clear understanding. Right. Okay, good. Thank you for that question, Alicia. I'm glad she said that because um, mine is a little bit different, but I was thinking about kind of what she was thinking about, uh, you know, her grandmother. I was thinking in Christianity, though, since that's our background and uh, in a funny way, I would say those were our ancestors of the religion we were, you know, holding so, so tight to it does still speak to though, like the, the doctrines or theology that was misunderstood by them that was passed on. Like things that we talk about over and over again, we thought was scripture were not. So like even in the book of James, not understanding it, whether they had it in their canon or not, it still was misunderstood. It's still somehow, a, that's how I've gained value with the question that you asked and the importance of it, because it still has shaped us in many ways, either directly or indirectly, because of how they handled the book or what they misunderstood of the book. No doubt. Indeed, what you're saying is so true. And that's, in fact, what our textbook author is, be is getting ready to tell us. What has been passed down to us over the centuries and generations is not the scripture, the epistle of James, but what's been passed down to us as uh, Ashante, you will tell eventually the introduction to the Bible students, what has been passed down to us is the interpretations of the church fathers, the patristic fathers, the medieval fathers, the Protestant reformers. We need to have our own experience with God's word. Because as you have rightly said, Alicia, let's, let's kind of take a journey through what these earlier fathers, what their experience was with the epistle of James. Let's look at it here. On page, uh, uh, let's go on to page 28 and watch this here. Uh, 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 I want to draw your attention to the middle of that first paragraph where it says, The Shepherd of Hermas. If you can go down about 10 lines from the top, watch this. The Shepherd of Hermas, 
early or middle second century has a significant number of parallels to James. In the section of that book called The Mandate, several of James's characteristic, characteristic themes are found. The encouragement to pray with faith and without double-mindedness in Mandate 9 is particularly close in wording to the emphasis of James 1, 6 through 8. Probably this section of Hermas is dependent on James. It is also possible that First Clement of AD 95 and the Epistle of Barnabas show dependence on James, but this is less certain. Clement, head of the important catechetical a catechetical school in Alexandria is said to have written a commentary on James, but no such commentary has ever been discovered. And Clement never shows dependence on James in an extent, extent writing. Clement's successor in Alexandria, Origen, is the first to refer to the letter of James by name. So Origen is the first to refer to the epistle of James by name. Well, let's find Origen here in, in the early church fathers here. Look what Origen is among the early church fathers. Towards the end of the early church fathers, here's the first person in church history nearly 200, 150 years after this epistle was written was, was the first time Christians, the church ever acknowledged that there was an epistle of James. Wow, Origen is the first church father to mention the epistle of James by name, quoting from it. Watch this here. Let's go back to this here. Watch this. Uh, 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 um, he attributes the, the watch this, it, 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 he cites the letter as scripture and attributes the letter to James the apostle. So let me get this. Origen is the first Christian leader to cite the epistle of James as scripture. And he writes that the apostle James wrote it not the brother of Jesus the Christ. Wow. Let's keep reading. The Latin translation, top of page 29, of Origen's work made by Rufinus explicitly identifies the author of the letter as the brother of the Lord, but the reliability of Rufinus's work is open to question. So now we get to Eusebius. Let me go to the, to the next chart. Now we get to Eusebius. Now we're into nearly 300. Eusebius, uh, 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 um, uh, uh, watch this here. Uh, Eusebius uses James frequently in his writings and apparently accords it canonical status. However, he also includes it among the disputed books as we just looked at the church's New Testament as it gained acceptance, signifying that he was aware of some Christians who questioned its scriptural authority. After Eusebius, there's Theodore. There's Theodore of Mopsuquita, Suquitia rejected all the general epistles. James was, however, included in the fifth century Syriac translation, the Peshitta, and is quoted approvingly by Christendom and Theodoret. Uh, uh, so, so you see, as we move down uh, 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 this uh, early church father's list here, more and more patristic fathers now are having their experience with it. The situation in the West was similar, although acceptance of James came a bit later there. Neither the Moratorian canon nor the Mosin catalog mentions James. The earliest clear reference to James in the West come in the middle of the fourth century when Hilary of Pontiers and Ambroster uh, uh, each quote James. So here's getting down here. Hillary and Ambrose. So you got the church in the, 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 the uh, uh, West and the church in the East. There's the East up there. 
And here's the West down here. And so the point that the, the textbook author is outlining the place of James in the New Testament canonical history. It was one of the later books to be accepted as divine scripture. And uh, uh, in the bottom of this page 29, you see Jerome's influence. Uh, uh, Augustine at the bottom there. So th this was this book was hotly debated among patristic early and patristic fathers. It was not easily accepted as canon. Look at the top of page thirty. Thus, James came to be recognized as canonical in all segments of the early church, and this without the benefit of a single authority imposing a decision. To be sure, James's status was not immediately recognized, but it is important to stress that James was not rejected but neglected, our textbook author says. How many, how may we uh, explain, uh, neglect be explained? Uh, uh, um, go down about six lines here. He says, uh, uh, after talking about, and I encourage you to go back and read all of this. I'm just highlighting some points. The letter betrays a strong Jewish orientation and was probably written to Jerusalem churches in Palestine or Syria. The early demise of the Jewish church in Palestine as a result of Jewish revolts of 66 and 132 may have resulted in a serious slowdown in the circulation of the letter. Jewish history. If you don't know Jewish history, if you're not coherent chronologically and historically, if you don't know church history, and you are under the impression that this book of the Bible always existed and was always circulated widely among the church in the first 400 years, all of these things will hinder and keep you in your capacity to rightly understand the epistle of James. Any other questions? Well, watch this then. Let's go to this last paragraph on page 30. Watch this hysteria. It was at the time of the Reformation that doubts about James were again expressed. Erasmus, impressed by the good quality of James's Greek, questioned the traditional view that the letter was written by the Lord's brother. Luther, too, questioned the apostolic authorship of James, but his criticism went much deeper than Erasmus's. For Luther, the sticking point was the theological tension that he perceived between James and the chief New Testament books over the matter of justification by faith. James said Luther uh, uh, James, said Luther, mangles the scriptures and thereby opposes Paul and all scripture. So, Hysteria, James does not do this. Luther says James does this. And Luther's position has largely been passed down to Protestants. James never opposes Paul, but Luther says James opposes Paul. And as a Christian, I've been trained in Protestantism. I've had not my own experience with the word of God, except through the influence and bias and tradition of Protestantism. Does that make sense a little bit, Hysteria? So I have no capacity. When I read that verse of scripture, I only see it as in opposition to Pauline doctrine on justification. So I'm troubled by it. Why am I troubled? 
because all I've had is what somebody said, somebody said, somebody said, somebody said over a hundred times till it came down to me. But I've had no real training and experience with the epistle of James on my own. I hope that makes a little sense, hysteria, and to the class. <sighs> Along with Jude, Hebrews, and Revelation, therefore, Luther consigned James to the end of his German translation of the New Testament. But while Luther obviously had difficulties with James and came close to giving the letter a secondary status, his criticism should not be overdrawn. He did not exclude James from the canon, and it has been estimated cities over half of the uh, uh, estimated cities over half the verses of James as authoritative sites rather over half the verses of James as authoritative in his writings. Even the so-called epistle of straw reference must be understood in its context. So Luther called James, the epistle of James, an epistle of straw. And what are the implications of that? Not to be viewed as authoritative as those which are given by God. What is this straw metaphor Luther is talking about? Let me just check in with you all. What does Luther mean by straw and where does he get that from? The calling James an epistle of straw, Fritzy and Glenn. You might have got that from the writings of Paul in the letter to the Corinthians. Did y'all hear that? He got that from 1 Corinthians 3, 11 through 15. Yes. And there, what does Paul say? Your works are going to be tried by the fire. Yes. So what is Luther implying about the epistle of James? Yeah, y'all might have put this in the Bible, but when we stand before the judgment seat of Jesus Christ, you're going to find out that that was not God's word. Because it's going to be tried by the fire and only what silver, gold, and precious stones will survive the fire. But straw <laughs> going to be burned up going to be revealed and exposed as not being from God. Wow. So why should I listen to anything Martin Luther has to say? If that's what he thought about the epistle of James, then how much did he really understand about the word of God? <laughs> Any questions or comments on that? So you and I as disciples of Jesus Christ, we have work to do. And we cannot afford to call ourselves disciples of Jesus Christ and continue to expose ourselves to error. Institutions of men who really don't know what they're talking about. Our lives will never be pleasing to the Lord so long as we gallop behind false teachings and not have our own relationship with the word of God. Few of the other reformers followed Luther in his criticism of James. Calvin, for instance, while admitting that James seems more sparing in proclaiming the grace of Christ than it behooved an apostle to be, notes that it is not surely required of all to handle the same arguments. He accepted the apostolic authority of James and argued for a harmonization between James and Paul on the issue of justification. So we're now to the Protestant Reformation period as we are following church history. This is called historical theology. We, we do need, as we engage God's word, we should investigate if what I am now finding out is wrong, where did I get my thinking from? 
Where does it come from if it does not come from the word of God itself? And that's what the textbook author has done here, you all, in those first pages. Any questions or comments about any of that? Okay. Look like all hearts are clear. Then let's, let's return back then to a PowerPoint slide here today. Let's go back to then where we've left off here. On PowerPoint slide number five then. Slide number five, we get into this introduction and overview even more after the uh, 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 27 through 31. This historical review is critical for students today if they are going to understand the depth of the controversy that surrounds the epistle of James, even to this very day. Many Bible scholars continue to be influenced by some of those traditional arguments. Slide six, leading in the controversy is authorship. Uh, many of you have experienced, even to this day, you have uh, triangulated, you've looked to different sources, for the authorship of the epistle of James. And still to this day, there is no uniformity among the church, among Christi Christendom, in terms of who the author of the epistle of James is. So my encouragement to disciples of Jesus Christ, you must come to this conviction ultimately based in the word of God for yourself. Uh, uh, you can go to this commentary, this dictionary, this encyclopedia, and you may get three different answers for who the author is of the epistle of James. But you and I must come to a place where we can make our own defense and argument for this epistle. As you know, identifying the human author of scripture is critical for proper biblical interpretation. There are four theories that are worth of, worthy of note regarding the authorship of this epistle. And uh, I encourage, I don't say disregard or ignore theological history, what the church has said on these matters over the time, I think we should become well engaged and acquainted with what the church has said over time. I know if you're in this class, even at this point here today, you, you should be saying, at least you should be saying, wow, I have a lot of work to do. There's a whole lot of work to do when it comes to handling God's word that I still have yet to do. I hope that's what you're saying to yourself about right now. If you are, you would be accurate. You would be right spot on. We have a lot of work to do before we call ourselves, our lives are being guided by the word of God. No, your life is not. You don't know what you're talking about when it comes to the word of God. All you know is acquired knowledge, what somebody else have told you. As disciples of Jesus Christ, we have a lot of work to do. So we should be good stewards of our lives of our time, good managers of our priorities, our values. How am I gonna get myself to the place where I'm making up? I heard Glenn say last year, I've wasted a whole lot of time in my life being a Christian. Just spinning my spinning wheels, going round and round in circles, not making progress. I got a lot of time to make up. I hope we all have come to that conviction there about by now. So when it comes to authorship, we have work and we should, as I will repeat again, that work should involve becoming informed about historical theology, the position of the church throughout the centuries, as well as ultimately our own engagement with the word of God. Look at the bottom of page 31. 
uh, 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 it says here uh, the that the the author of the letter identifies himself simply as James. Who is this individual James? That, that's all we have in scripture. Let's look at it. The, the epistle of James begins with James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. So in verse number one, part A here, he identifies himself simply as James, a servant of God and of, of the Lord Jesus Christ. The New Testament knows of at least four different men named James. Here they are listed on page 32. Now, um, be careful about that. Say the New Testament knows about four men, James. I think if you and I were to survey the New Testament, we will identify more than four men named James. So what is the textbook? aiming to say to us. There are four Jameses mentioned in the New Testament of notoriety enough to write a letter and only say my name is James. When it is customary in the Hebrew culture, because the names of men and women were so limited, they didn't have the kind of creativity like Pookie and uh, 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 Zakina. I mean, their names were limited <laughs> and simple. Uh, uh, they didn't. They didn't have. They didn't have a whole lot of you know names we make up today. They were very limited. So how did they identify people with the same names? They identified them by some characteristic, usually geography. Jesus of Nazareth, or Jesus of Capernaum, or Jesus of Bethlehem. So they usually either Saul of Tarsus, Mary of Magdala, or Mary Magdalene. So they usually identify them by some geographical location, or James the Great, James the Less. Uh, or some other characteristic of, of, of some sort. That is Jewish custom. So who would have been so popular and well known in the Jesus community to write a letter and only identify himself as James? That's what the textbook author is saying. So I wanted to make sure we were uh, aware of what he says when he makes this statement at the bottom of page 31, the New Testament knows of at least four different men named James. In essence, what the textbook author is saying, four men in the early Jesus movement that would have been of such notoriety or popularity that to say James would have been enough to identify them. That's what he's saying, four men. Any questions about that? I, I know you all was probably uh, moved by Pookie. <laughs> No pookies. There were no pookies in the, uh, the New Testament times among the Jews. Are you talking about pookie from 6th Street or the one or what? <laughs> right. It's so many pookies. <laughs> you got to know where they from, too. Everybody's family got a pookie. <laughs> But then, so 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 James was as popular as Pookie. <laughs> so the first one at the top of page thirty-two is James the son of Zebedee. Number two, James the son of Alphaeus. Uh, number three, James the father of Judas. And number four, James the Lord's brother. Now I gave you last week <clears throat> this fam these family trees of Jesus. So this is not even simple. Because first you got the Catholic view, and the, as far as the Catholics are concerned, Jesus, so this is more Christians than any, most Christians don't believe Jesus had a brother named James, because most Christians are Catholics, and this is the Catholic view. The Catholic view is that this James is really Joseph's son, James the Less, who became an apostle. And also this other James was a, a Salome and Zebedee's son. 
So Jesus had two apostles named James. And so the Catholic view would make the, one of these James, either one of these James is Jesus's half brother. And this is why there is so much controversy. You see James uh, of Alphaeus uh, 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 and then James of Zebedee. So there is Alphaeus James right there, according to the Catholic view. And there is Zebedee's James, according to the Catholic view. What about the Protestants view? Here's the Protestants view. That this Jesus and James which is later called James the Righteous, is the brother of Jesus. And there is the key, A, B, C, D, F, G, and I. There is the support for this Protestant view of, of James. So that's how you would use the, those two charts there. So you got these four views here. Let's go to back to the textbook, the middle of page 32. The James of the epistle need not, of course, be identified with a James mentioned in the New Testament. It is possible that this could be a James that's not either one of those four. But the use of the name by itself in a letter written with such authority implies that the author was a well-known figure, and it is improbable that such an individual would have gone unmentioned in the New Testament. Not impossible, but improbable. Um, there is a whole group that's not mentioned explicitly in the New Testament that we know existed. And in all likelihood, Jesus had encounters with them. So it's not impossible. There is not one single mention of the Essenes in the New Testament scriptures, but we know they existed. There is not one mentioning of the community at Qumran, but we know they existed in Jesus' time, in the gospel times, and New Testament time. But there is not a single explicit mentioning of them, so this keeps us as Bible students grounded. Just because it's not mentioned in the Bible does not mention, does not mean it is not so. That is something that I realize as Bible students, we have to continue to rehearse and practice because we were not brought up that way. We were brought up the other way. If it's not in the Bible, I really don't even need to pay attention to it or give it any serious consideration. Any comments on that? So we do have to be mindful that what he is saying here in the middle of the page, that that is an option. Of the four New Testament James, it's only the son of Zebedee and the Lord's brother stand out as prominent. James, the son of Zebedee, however, died a martyr's death in AD 44. According to Acts chapter 12, that is a, a, a within the year of the writing of this epistle. So the first apostle dies within the year of the writing of this epistle. Some may say, well, AD 44 is close. This James could have written this letter. Right, the Apostle James could have written this letter right before he died. Our textbook author takes the position it is unlikely that the epistle was written as early as this. We are left, therefore, with James, the Lord's brother, as the most likely author of the epistle. Uh, again, uh, you have to uh, 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 work hard to satisfy yourself. Uh, uh, of this kind of situation, we've already made a presentation for this position. But even with that presentation, uh, you have to come to your own conviction on these kind of things here. Excuse me. This James became, a, 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 because the Lord's brother as early as 45 AD, how long is 45 AD after the 
uh, crucifixion of Jesus. 15 years. So take a point in your life. Go back 15 years. This is an exercise, Bible students. This is why chronology and timeline is important, especially when it's contemporary or in the same generation, because you can do this kind of exercise mostly with the New Testament. Uh, being familiar with the timeline and chronology of the New Testament, you and I can take in our own lives, go back 15 years. So, James, the brother of Jesus, being this popular among the Jesus community, on its face present challenges, has some issues with that position. Um, what might I mean by that, Glenda? We have a on the surface to say James, the brother of Jesus, wrote this letter, have come to this level of popularity within the church community or the Jesus community 15 years later after his death is not without issues or challenges. What, what, what are some, what do I mean by issues or challenges, uh, Glenda? Well, one of the things that I would probably question is why was it such a long distance between the time after his death that this was written? Uh, uh, um, well, that's another issue, and we'll address your issue uh, uh, after we answer this question. What, uh, 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 unless you're saying if Jesus' mm -hmm. brother wrote this letter, why would he wait 15 years later to write this letter? It that's sounds like that's what you're offering, Glenda. Yes, it is. Okay, okay then, then, then I think that's good. That, that, that is a legitimate question to my question. That is a good way to answer my question with a question, an acceptable way. A challenge would be, why would Jesus' brother have to wait so long. The reason I'm accepting that, because in a backwards way, that is answering your question. Uh, who knows the answer to that? Why would Jesus's brother have wait so long before he write this letter, Renita? Well, um, Jesus's family, other than his mother, didn't believe that he was the Messiah, and they didn't believe until Pentecost, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, so Renita is saying, well, uh, Glenda, it may have taken so long because he himself did not believe his brother was the promised Messiah. And then, and you know, go ahead, Glenda. And you know, that's what I thought about, that he, he himself did not believe, James didn't believe him. Mm-hmm. And so, since he didn't believe him, maybe it did take him that long. So, you know, it's just a, uh, up and down. But that do I did you, think. Do you know when he believed that Jesus was the Messiah? Was it not after his death? So actually, he did believe that he was the Messiah. Renita said the day of Pentecost, which is 50 okay. days after his death. Okay. But, act but actually, we are told that James believed before Pentecost. Right? Renita, you willing to stipulate to that adjustment? that before Pentecost, James believed. Yeah, because wasn't he a witness to the resurrection? He was a witness to the resurrected Christ, according to Paul. James was a witness to the resurrected Christ. Look at Acts chapter 1, verse 15. Uh, um, 
In those days, Peter stood up among the brothers. The company of persons was all in all about 120. Who were these brothers? Uh, 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 who were these 120? Back to verse 14. All these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and who? His brothers. So who would Jesus' brothers be in this case? Hoses, Ho Hoses, James, Jude. So at least three of Jesus' brothers would have been among the 120 who was in the upper room on the day of uh, Pentecost. Okay, Renita? So based on that, wouldn't that just completely nullify the Catholic view of Jesus? You would, you would think so, but the Catholics have convinced their followers that this is a cultural thing. They called everybody brothers, even if they were not their biological brothers. That is the Catholic explanation. Everywhere you see Jesus' brothers, ignore what the Bible is saying. We, the church, the hierarchy, the clergy of the church, we interpret scripture, not you. And we, the church, say those were Jesus' cousins. And in Hebrew culture, you never really hear the word cousin. So cousins and brothers are one and the same. That's the Catholic position, Renita. Okay. <laughs> that is the Catholic position there. But I would think uh, uh, unless the scriptures uh, 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 make that plain, I'm not going to just automatically, uh, uh, because when it comes to biblical interpretation, if plain sense makes sense, then seek no other sense. So uh, uh, it seems plainly to me, Jesus did have brothers. There is no reason for me to uh, interject an interpretation of the scriptures that basically does not require that I do so. There are times when I see the word brothers in scriptures, I should seek another sense other than the plain reading of scripture but not in this case, but the Catholics do. The Catholics feel led to, to seek another sense here. Uh, so yes, James was not a believer as we're going to find out on Monday night. Uh, uh, this is Monday, so uh, tonight we're gonna find out in the Gospel of John. We're gonna study that in John chapter seven, where we are told that his brothers did not believe in him as the Messiah. Uh, uh, but we are also told immediately in the days after his resurrection, he appeared to one of his brothers and no doubtedly all of his brothers, uh, 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 he appeared to his entire family among this 120 disciples. Uh, so, but that is a problem, but this appearance and their belief comes within weeks after Jesus is, so why, uh, uh, so then being ridden Glenda 15 years later, is not an issue because if this is James, the brother of Jesus for 15 years now, he's been a follower of Jesus Christ. <laughs> so he's not a new follower 15 years later, he's been a follower. Uh, but what we also identify, we are able to see his, uh, his journey, his ascension, so to speak, to leadership among the church. James is not initially a leader of the church. He is merely a disciple of Jesus Christ. But from Acts chapter 1 to Acts chapter 11, by the time we get to Acts chapter 11, he is now holding an office. 
He is now among the elders, the leaders of the Jerusalem church. So uh, uh, over about that 15 year period, about 10 years, he goes from being a disciple of Jesus Christ to being called to the office as an elder, a leader among uh, the leadership of the Jerusalem church. Yes, Bernice. And that's what I wanted to ask you about. Um, he was just a disciple at first, but was he, was he also a part of uh, the temple, the Sanhedrin temple, or a, a Pharisee or something? How did he get to such status so quick? Well, uh, again, first of all, it was not so quick. Uh, I mean, I don't know. Are you calling 15 years quick? Have you known people in your life, Bernice, that 15 years ago they were not a pastor, a preacher, but now they are? I don't know. Did you think that was quick? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but he uh, had, you know, he had a lot of status with the uh, Jewish leaders. And I was wondering how he get to get so much status. Was he a, a, a part of the temple or something? What we know from historians and from what we are able to tell from the time, uh, uh, James, like, oh, he was a devout Jew and mm -hmm. was a devout uh, Jew who practiced the law. Uh, 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 James would have been unlike Jesus, his brother, and other Galileans who were viewed as outside of, they were very liberal in their interpretation of Moses, people farther away from Jerusalem in Galilee area okay. were, were viewed as liberal in their interpretation of the law. Let's yeah. see, I'll pull one up here. So James is distinguished in the sense, Bernie's, he, even though he's from Galilee, even though James is from Galilee, he has a very conservative practice and belief of the Mosaic law, like okay. people of Judea. That's what, when you hear uh, secondary sources talk about him possibly being a Pharisee and a Sadducee, we have no real evidence that any of that is true. What mm -hmm. is more likely true is that he was much more conservative in his understanding and interpretation of the law than Jesus, his brother, would have been or other Galileans would have been. And that's why he, he uh, uh, had a, a, a level of acceptance among those at uh -huh. Jerusalem. Okay, I was so, wondering because yeah. I'm getting a little bit ahead of where you at, but I mm -hmm. was thinking about when he went and uh, talked to him about getting Peter, who was it, Peter and somebody else out of jail that time, and they let him go in his care. Now, now, where do you see that? Where, where did that happen? <laughs> I'm probably not. Uh, quoting it, saying it right, but didn't he get somebody released from jail? Not that I know of. I'm, that's why I'm, 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 I'm willing. Maybe you know something that I don't know. <laughs> probably a uh, probably from AD that I used to look at. <laughs> uh -huh. I know he said that he was um uh, he had it's authority true. among the Pharisees mm -hmm. and the Sadducees, and I was wondering why. Well, Bernice, well, let me tell you where that comes from. Look at the top of page 33, Bernice. Okay. Uh, 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 the, the first sentence, full sentence at the top of page 33 says, much of our information about James comes from Hegesippus' account of James's death as recorded by Eusebius. Hegesippus is where you got that information from, Bernice. Oh, okay. You didn't even know where it came from. It didn't come from I, the scriptures. I sure didn't. <laughs> it came from Vegas Okay, I'll have to look him up. 
he wrote, he wrote more extensively about James than any other writer. We okay. learn more about James from Hegel's Sisyphus' writings than we do the scriptures, Josephus, or any other source. So okay. notice Hegesippus, watch this. Hegesippus, when we were looking at that family tree, uh-huh. Look at where a lot of the information come from. Look at G. I'm looking at Hegesippus, uh, Hegesippus as preserved in Eusebius' history of the church. Okay. So this Jewish historian wrote more about James than any other source of writing. Okay. So that's why I was being I was being a bit cavalier and, and uh, uh, with you, Bernie's, when I was saying, "Well, where did you get that from?" Because that's not in Scripture that James had anything to do with the release of Peter or anybody from prison or from yeah. Roman uh, incarceration. Okay, I just wanted a clear understanding on it. Um, I probably have been, I used to read a lot of commentaries, so maybe I heard heard about him uh, when I was doing that or something. I don't know. I know it stuck in my mind that he was uh, higher up in the Jewish council or something. No, I, I don't believe any reports can be validated that he held any official place among the Jews in terms of uh, of the Jerusalem uh, court, judicial court, the Sanhedrin. He was not a Pharisee, not a Sadducee. None of that would be reliable. But, okay. it, but what is clear, <clears throat> as circumstances were developing, James would have been viewed by the religious establishment as the best hope of reeling this Jesus community in oh, okay. and keeping them in check, so to speak. James would have uh, uh, served in that capacity from everything we know, but he did not hold any official position among the uh, Sanhedrin. Uh, 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 we have no information, reliable information. Some scholars, I read them to Bernice, who mm -hmm. say, he, the only way he could have had this kind of influence is he must have been one of them. That turns out to be nothing but conjecture okay. and no real okay. evidence for that. Yes, Glenda. Okay. Okay, now let me ask you this. Is it not so that Peter sent word to James at, at one point to tell James to give James a message? That is true. After Peter was released okay. from, uh, 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 from, from prison, look at it here at Acts chapter 12. After Peter uh, uh, is uh, released from uh, prison, watch this here. Um, uh, look at verse 17. Mm -hmm. You see, I have it underlined. Tell these things to James and to the brothers. Then he departed and went to another place. Okay. So, so you can see, Bernice, apparently James did not have direct involvement in Peter's release. Peter's sending a messenger to tell James about what has happened, uh, 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 which within itself does not rule out some involvement of James, but we just don't have that with authority from scripture. But we do, as you're asking, Glenda, we identify that by Acts chapter 12, James has already been elevated to leadership as Jesus's apostles now have to flee Jerusalem, get out of harm's way out of Jerusalem. So James is among now the leaders who can safely stay public in Jerusalem. So uh, there's your question, Glenda, right there. The point of the matter is, what I hope is being, uh, um, uh, um, what is being modeled for you today 
is why our textbook author is spending so much time on these things. We as Bible students, as students of God's word, we must have this level of engagement in background information. And we must be careful as we've pointed out here today to do this work prayerfully and carefully since there are a lot of opinions, there's a lot of information and all of it is not a, a reliable information. We must let the word of God, scripture be our final authority and guide us in how we handle these other sources of information. It doesn't mean that the other information is inaccurate and wrong within itself. We just simply must not, we must be familiar enough with what we know to be scripture to set up a framework and guide us on how we handle and treat extra biblical or non-biblical information or non-canonical information. I hope that makes sense. So I encourage you to read the remainder of page 33, 34, and 35, especially. Read the remainder of that. Let me just go in the closing minutes back to the PowerPoint slide. Um, Bible students must be aware of the general Catholic and Protestant views regarding the Lord's brother. That's what we just looked at that. Finally, there are four noteworthy objections to the theory of Jesus's brother being the author. So uh, um, starting at the, uh, on page 36, rather, we get these, uh, you should also be balanced in this work, not being a, 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 a proof texter or, uh, or being biased, only looking for information that support your position. But I encourage you to review on page 36, 37, 38, uh, 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 and 39, a uh, 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 look at these views in page 40 that speak, that object to the Lord's brother of uh, being the author of the epistle of James. We should, uh, uh, as students of God's word, we should do diligence. We should do our due diligence rather and uh, become acquainted with both sides of argument so that we can be led by the spirit through the scriptures, how to navigate and avoid institutional and traditional era. We want to be able to help people who might be in one of these positions or the other. So uh, 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 I encourage you uh, um, to, to read those remaining pages as well. So that is the authorship of this epistle here. Let me just say a word here after we talk about the authorship. We've already uh, uh, talked about how James became a leader of the Jesus community. We, we've discussed that as well, somewhat out of order according to the agenda, but it, that's important that you become familiar knowing when James was converted and became a believer. The epistle uh, from Paul tells us Jesus not only appeared to the disciples corporately in which James would have been among them, but he had to first appear to James alone. And we are told in Corinthians 15 that he did. So before James was among the 120, that would have not been Jesus's first appearance to James there in Acts chapter one, verse 15, 14, 15, and so forth. That would have not been James's first appearance. Uh, James would have likely had a, 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 a personal appearance from his brother, uh, 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 our Lord and Savior, and then he would have been present in subsequent or other appearances by Jesus. James would have been a part of Jesus's teachings for 40 days in between his resurrection and his ascension to heaven. 
we are told in Acts 1 and 3 that for about 40 days, Jesus was teaching about the kingdom. You and I can assume fairly and safely that James would have been among that teaching. James would have also been among the disciples who continued in the apostles' teachings daily Acts 2, 46 and 47. James would have been a part of the teachings in Acts 3, 4, 5, when they chose men, seven men in Acts chapter 6. James is still just a disciple of Jesus Christ. He is not in office. Seven men were chosen who clearly at the time and among the people were of more uh, advancement than James was. Stephen and Philip and the other five, James is not even among them. But somewhere between Acts chapter 8, when now Philip, Stephen is martyred, Philip has to leave, there is no doubt in my mind, James will now be elevated there at the church of Jerusalem when these uh, 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 first seven are among the disciples persecuted and have to leave Jerusalem. Now, Bernie's, it becomes significant that James maintains a good relationship. James, the other disciples, the Jesus community in Acts chapter two, three, and four continued in five, Bernie's continued to go to the temple courts and teach and preach Jesus, proclaim Jesus. But after Acts chapter 7, the Jesus community is now expelled from the temple, generally speaking. But James still has access and can still go to the temple. What does that imply about James, the brother of Jesus? James must have been thought about salvation in a way that was akin to the Pharisees, Sadducees, and other religious status quo. How did they see salvation for the Gentiles? The Gentiles had to become proselytes of Judaism. You and I can be certain that James would have shared their view at this point in early church history. That's the kind of connections we want to be able to make. We cannot make those connections if we are not very familiar with the development. Uh, if so long as we Christianize these people, make them Christians and view them in through the lens of what we think Christians are today, we can never get to the place where we understand this development of the church of Jesus Christ, because there is no place for this development as long as we're calling them early Christians and, and that word Christian and Christianity is, is overshadowing the truth of, of the historical development of the church. I hope that makes a little sense to you. So I encourage you to continue to uh, 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 read those pages that we didn't get a chance to go over there uh, uh, in the textbook all the way to about the, uh, page 40 something. Uh, uh, and then we're going to come back to this as we do one last installment of the introduction. Any other comments, questions, or reflections before we close out? Okay, I pray that uh, uh, you were able to get some of this down. Uh, 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 Patricia, I hope you were able to get some good notes here today. Uh, Shantae, how did we do in attendance today? We didn't have anyone else on YouTube, um, so just what you see here. Okay, okay, very good. Well, I praise God for each of you today. And again, uh, as you now read through the textbook pages, write down your questions, comments, or reflections uh, 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 as you read through the given pages. And we'll pick right back up where we've left off on next week. With that said, let me cause you to join me in a word of prayer. Lord, we praise you and we thank you for the record that we have. We thank you, O oh Lord, that we can depend upon you. 
while we have at one time been tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine, by cunning and deceitful schemes of men. It is good to know today, Lord, that that does not have to be our record. We can move to a better place of having a relationship with you through the conviction of your spirit with your word where we are now able to discern the distinction between your truth and the mere traditions of me. But we know, O oh Lord, as we have demonstrated here today, these things are not easy to be achieved. We need you. We need your power. We need your strength. So Lord, we beg of you to continue to work on us, work on our minds, work on our motives. We now know if our heart desire, if this is merely an exercise in academics, if this is merely a tradition that we've always done, go to Bible study, then we know truth will continue to evade us. We will never know the truth. And these things will never make sense to us. Since we now know that you have reserved these things for those who will follow you only. So help us to move from a head knowledge to a heart knowledge to where we have every anticipation and that we are eager and zealous to identify areas of our lives that need to be impacted and transformed by your powerful word. Work on us day by day to move us to this place. We'll be careful to give you the praise, the glory and the honor for every bit of increase. In the name of Jesus, we do pray. Amen. I will see many of you all this evening in the Gospel of John. Have a great day, everyone. Bye. Bye. Have a great Bye. day. Have a good day. Bye. Yeah. Have a good day. Later. Bye-bye.